when you get people in your circle that you can trust, you know, you have to lean into that because we all don't know everything. But some of us are great earners, some of us are great leaders, um, some of us are great soldiers, you know what I'm saying? But if you lack something, you have to have somebody in your circle that you can actually trust that can put you on game because that could be the difference between you having, you know, a flash in the pan or, or, or having, you know, generational real wealth where it changes not only your life, it changes the people around your lives, right? Yes, young Jizzle from the bottom of the map. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Man, welcome What's to the town, baby. What's going on, my brother? Appreciate How you doing? It, man. man, I ain't doing no complaining, baby. We <laughs> You know, bless the holy faith. Why would we? Yeah, ain't nobody care anyway. <laughs> you feel me? Nah, man. Thank you for the hospitality, man. Appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, man. Thank you guys for the uh, invite to the Invest Fest, man. I was, I was very impressed. I love what you guys are doing, but I, I, I didn't expect that. <laughs> I'm just being honest, like, yeah. you know, because I, I, I heard of it, but when I got there, I was like, wow, this is. That's what's up, man. You know, I just I just love the fact that, um, you know, just mobilizing the culture, but at the same time, uh, giving people the tools to 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 get that generational wealth. You yeah. know what I'm saying? We we appreciate that. We appreciate you being there. It was uh, we knew it was gonna be our biggest, so we had to get a staple in Atlanta to close yeah, it out. Yeah, yeah, it was good. It was electric, man. <laughs> you know ain't, ain't nothing like seeing rich people have fun. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it works for me. <laughs> Uh, nah, so um, first and foremost, thank you for doing for sure, this. For you know, sure. It's going to be a powerful conversation. I want to talk about, you know, your your life is extremely interesting. Mm. And to watch it is actually amazing. And, um, you know, it's the evolution of hip hop to see people that we knew 20 years ago mm. to become the adults, the entrepreneurs that mm. they are now. Mm. And starting, starting in the streets, becoming a rapper, and now on the business mogul, mm. best selling author and all of that. It's like three different transitions that we've been able to watch and see. Right. So I want to ask you, how does that look as far as from a business aspect? You taking the business acumen that you learned in the street, mm -hmm. applying it to the music business, mm -hmm. and then applying it to entrepreneurship? Mm. Good question. Uh, first, I'll, I'll start off by saying that everything I've learned about business was in the street, right? And when you're in the streets and you're dealing with dire consequences, meaning that if you get caught, you're going to jail. If you get caught slipping, you're going, you're going to be in somebody's casket. You know what I'm saying? And that was the extreme. And you had to learn fast and quick. So that took, you know, how to manage money, how to have safe places to put it, how to be able to trust people, how to keep checks and balances, and all those things. It was all business school for me. But the reality of it is, is the reason why I got into the streets is because I was trying to find a way, to find a way. Meaning that I knew in the beginning that I wanted to be a CEO. I wanted to be an entrepreneur, right? I didn't know what that meant then. I just know that watching my family, the way they was brought up, my mom being a maid, um, you know, uh, my aunts and uncles working in factories, you know, us not really having a lot, not really owning anything. I think the only person that had a house that really owned it was my grandmother and my uncle, right? And the rest of us was trying to figure it out. Me and my mom and my sister grew up in a trailer that's not bigger than this room. You know what I'm saying? And for me, it was just like, how do I get where I need to go, you know, and still keep who I am, right? And I listened to music every morning before school. Tupac, Ghetto Boys, uh, A-Bar, MJG, you name it. But I listened to the music to get the game. So I was listening to Master P, what he was talking about and all that, because it sounded like business to me. It didn't just sound like music. But that's how I was learning. So I don't think a lot of people know that, you know, music is my talent, but business has always been my passion. And I knew I wasn't going to be able to walk from the streets into a boardroom, into an office. It wasn't going to happen, right? And I knew the quickest way to get there from A to Z was to find something that I could do and I could do it the best myself and use that as the vessel to get me to business. So what you see sitting before you was what I was working on then because I didn't plan, like I never planned to be a rapper. I never wanted to be a rapper. Mm -hmm. Like when I first started, I started as a CEO. I was investing money in people and it just didn't work out. And then I had to end up doing it myself because at the time I was down there broke investing in other people and it went left, right? And 
So what you see here is like where I was trying to get. So you used rap as a springboard all Correct. along to get. It was never like you was like I want to be the best rapper ever. No, and no, 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 studying no. bars. No, 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 no. It's like Jay Z, like what he always says, like I'm a hustler first. Not I just know how to rap. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just you know, I, you know, it, I just understand it. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And I understood how to tell stories, you know, my way. And for me, like, rap is rap is amazing because if the right person says the right thing at the right time, it, it can captivate someone who's who's got a, a very vivid imagination in a way, right? Mm -hmm. And the only pre people that I saw that really had real money and they had real influence was the rappers. It was the Master P's and the Birdman's and these guys that I'm like, okay, that's that's a boss because that's the only boss I ever seen. I never seen the boss of Microsoft or nothing. Right, right, right. So, like, that's the biggest boss I ever seen. You know what I'm saying? You know, at the time, and um, I was like, damn, I could I could do that. Let me figure that out. And I wouldn't say use rap as a springboard because I know there's levels to it. You know, just like the streets. You know, I started off small time. You know, built my way up. You know, and and, and state to state and da -da -da and whatever, but. I understood the process was not to get caught, to save my money so I could use it for something else. And then when I got into music, I saw it the same process. Of course, I went through my times where I was spending and blowing money because it's like, I couldn't believe it. You know what I'm saying? Like, well, like, I do this and they give me a check, like a real check. Like, oh, shit. you know, by the way, you got to talk to John Plant uh, over at Warner because he was the first person that gave me a, a check for publishing, right? Back hey, John. Then. I ain't cashed the check for like a year and a half. He called me. He's like, yo, what's going on with the check I gave? I said, I'm going to keep it real with you. I left it in some <laughs> pants, and I think it got faded, and I don't know where it's at. How much was the check for? A few million. And, and Jay-Z called me like, yo, man, you got to quit playing. And that's how I was like, all right, I got to. So you, you didn't need a few million dollars? <laughs> Not at the time. Because when he gave me the, you know, because when I came in from music, when I came in from the streets to music, you know, I, you know, I was good. Like, I had, <laughs> I was straight. So the, the, the music to me... I was more infatuated with the fact that people liked what I was doing. You, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I didn't, I didn't need the money, it, so I thought, yeah. right? You know what I'm saying? And I just, I just had the bread. So to me, it was just like, and then I was getting money for shows. It was just like, it was like taking ice cream from a baby. Like it was, it, it was the sweetest <laughs> ever. So when he gave me a check, I didn't even have an account. Think no, about that. No bank account. No. When Def Jam gave me my check, I didn't have an account. Shoebox. Shoebox. Shoe box. And I was just putting the checks in the box. In the just boxes. putting checks in box, like they money, like it's bills. Well, because I didn't understand how it worked. Ah. You see what I'm saying? I was too embarrassed. To ask. To ask. How to open the account. What do I do? Who do I talk to? Right. And by the way, I was paranoid of the banks because the first thing I'm thinking if they... The feds come. Yeah, it's going to be money laundering. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> still got that that's, mentality. That's how I got that mentality. Yeah, yeah. But I wanted to be in business and I was just like, you know, to me, and I've never did anything just per se for the money. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I love what I do. I love the fact that I could talk to people who come from where I come from and tell them, hey, bro, that's why any game I get, I try to give it back. Just, just like you all do, but I try to package it up in a way that is digestible and it's not like I'm trying to tell somebody what to do. Because yeah. I can only imagine how many other people got checks yeah. and it was just like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I got to get an account. Like, I've been counting my own money for a decade. Like, I don't need Buy nobody. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. Tell me what I can spend. I'm, I'm pretty good at managing money. I will say that, yeah. right? I've had my times where I, I went overboard, but I know how to bring myself back. So when you start hearing that you got to get an accountant and you got to talk to all these people and, you know, everybody get a percentage, I don't understand that. You know what I'm saying? So I'm having to get you know, first-hand coaching on this, and it was it was a, it was a shock to me because the first thing is I don't know who's taking advantage of me because yeah. this is new to me, right? Yeah, I, I want to talk about that, though, because yeah. a couple of things there, right? When I'm listening to you talk about, I'm listening, I'm thinking about the titles, right? right. The recession. Yep. Corporate thugging. Yeah. It's business all in it. It was all, yeah, but that's the thing. <laughs> right? Because that was the, the, the vision for me is how do I get into this and which, which, you know, everybody, you know, says Jay, Jay, this and that. And I respect, you know, of course, as an artist, right? But what I respect most about Jay, he was able to get in this game and evolve and keep his integrity and keep his, his, his brand where it is. And that's what I wanted, right? So when I got into this game, 
I, I, I kind of spoke it into existence, like I'm corporate thugging, because that's what I really wanted to be. Yeah. You, you see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. And then the thug motivation was a class. You know what I mean? Like you guys, but I was like, who gonna come to my class? I'm, I'm, I'm gonna teach all the street guys. Mm -hmm. And that's why I started going with the titles. And then the inspiration was when I started to be inspired by different things and different people. And then the recession was when I was sitting in a room having dinner with these, uh, these gentlemen and they kept talking about the recession and how they was concerned and what they was gonna do to change. But I'm looking at them like, y'all all rich. Why y'all worried about that? And he's like, do you know what a recession is? And I'm like, yeah, but I didn't. So I had to go Google it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know yeah we, we always talk about the recession. It was, it was it affects us differently because we always felt like we were in a recession. Right. Right. Like we've we've always had right. less than right. So when we are around people that have had that right. circumstance. Yeah, okay, it's gonna cost us a little bit more to get, yeah, it, it affects us differently. Right. I wanna go back to the part about being taken advantage of because one of the things you, you did have was capital. Right. And when you have capital, sometimes you overpay. Yes. Right, and I know that was some things that you had to go through. You're like, yes. I, I'm paying top dollar because yes. I don't know anything, but people know I have cash. Talk about how well, having money sometimes could be a disadvantage. Well, <laughs> it could be a disadvantage and a blessing in disguise, right? <laughs> Uh, I'll, I'll go and say that, you know, shout out to Coach K, right? QC. Yeah, QC. You know, Coach heard about me because everybody was saying that I was at the studio just spending money, right? And there's like this kid up here, he got Lexus, he got all these chains, and he's just buying whatever because I didn't know nobody. Uh, and, and Coach came around to see what that was about. And that's how me and Coach met, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? Because he came to the studio, I'm like, yo, what you got going on? And I'm telling him, but you know, I'm, I'm like, whatever, I need it. You know what I mean? I need this producer, that producer. And it was times that, you know, shout out to Lil John, Pretty Ken, all those guys. I was giving them guys fifty and sixty thousand dollars in a in a Kroger's plastic bag <laughs> for beats. You know, thinking that's all I had to do to get on. You know what I'm saying? And I didn't understand a lot about the business, but it got me a respect that people know I paid like I weighed, right? But at the same time, did I spend millions of dollars that I probably didn't have to spend if I had a better plan? Absolutely. But I learned a lot, mm -hmm. so I can't feel no type of way about it. And also, it, it gave me the ability, you know, to not, to do it my way. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Because if you don't have capital, somebody else is going to try to tell you what your vision is, right? But the fact that I had my own hard-earned money that I took penitentiary chances for, I think it's been long enough for me to say that. Alleged. <laughs> alleged. Uh, that's, that's alleged. As it, as it's <laughs> right. <laughs> and I took a penny attention chances for, I spent it different. I spent it with a different type of pride, a different type of swagger, a different type of confidence. Because I'm like, you guys don't come from where I come from, and this is hard earned money. So when I was doing that, you know, of course it took me a long time to get on, but when I really went in the studio, I didn't go in like I'm this guy who already is on. I'm going in like I'm this guy who's spending his own money on his own time, so this better be the best I've ever done. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I'm saying because if I got to go back and get some more money, I already know what I got to do, right? Yeah. So that that gave me an edge there. But as you was going back to say, like being taken advantage of, there was a lot of situations where I overpaid. Absolutely. Well, knowledge is power, and um, I want to go back to the shoebox thing because I think it's important. Right. We interviewed Yo Gotti, and he was saying that when he first started getting money. He just started buying property, and he right. bought 15 properties in Memphis. What he didn't realize is that he paid it for, in cash. Cash, yeah. What he didn't realize is that you have to pay property taxes. Right. So he was like, three years later, he gets all these notices, like, we're about to foreclose on your homes. And right. he's like, well, they paid for it in right. cash. And then he took it to his lawyer, who was actually a criminal lawyer, because that's the only lawyer that he knew. And his lawyer referred him to a, a property lawyer. Mm -hmm. And they educated him on property taxes. Mm -hmm. And that's how he learned that you actually have to pay property taxes, right. even if you own the house cash. So you said you had the checks and you didn't you was kind of embarrassed on like opening a bank account or mm -hmm. like how to set up your business. How much money do you think you actually had in checks before you opened up a bank a account? A few million for sure. In a in a in a box, in a shoe box. Well, some of, I left one in my Visa jeans, I was with, with Red Monkeys back then. <laughs> one was in there, it got put in the cleaners. So you just having checks all over the place? Yeah, because I, I didn't understand what it was. You didn't was. know what a check really no, was? No, I didn't. I mean, I'm gonna be honest with you. I'm thinking like it's just the money sitting somewhere when I'm running to go get it, I just called John. Mm. Wow. You know so you thought it was like a notification that Stipend. this money is, he not even that, probably like a certificate that shows you yeah. the money is there. I'm gonna be honest with you, I was so, What's the word I want to look for? 
I was so amazed at God for getting me out of the situation that I went to. I didn't even care about the money, bro. Like, I'm going to keep it a buck. Mm. Like, I just, I, I knew I was on my way to my freedom, and I was doing something that I loved, and I didn't even take the time to investigate, right? Because nobody that was running with me probably even ever seen a check in their whole life. You feel what I'm saying? Mm. If I even asked my uncle, he probably the biggest check he probably seen is an unemployment check. So who do you ask? <laughs> you know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, yeah. And I'm negotiating these contracts through my lawyer myself, but I'm just only going by what I learned from the streets. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So it's almost like, what's that thing where you're so smart, you're dumb? Mm -hmm. You know, which is something a lot of us go through. Like, yeah. like, yeah. It's like how am I gonna tell somebody in this generation who already made, you know, 50 million doing it their way anything different? I already won. You can't tell me that. And that's how I felt. I felt like I'd already won. So who was I gonna go talk to? about this new life that I was living. Well, who was that person? Yeah. Who educated you and who brought you yeah. to the bank to be like, okay, enough is enough, yeah. bro? Well, well, my business partner, shout out to Solo, uh, me and him started sitting down. And what I would do when I came off a tour on Sundays, I would, I would drop all the homies off, because you got to think, at that time, I was around like 100 people. You know, I'd drop all the homies off, and he was running Justin's, and I would go sit up to Justin's with him, and he opened up a bottle of wine, and he'd give me a cigar, and he'd tell me the cigar, where the wine is from. And we'll smoke, smoke a cigar, drink some wine. He'll just ask me questions. Okay, what do you want to do? I, mean, I want to do real estate. He like, okay, let's talk about it. I tell him what I want to do. The next Sunday I came back. He he had my my partner Tony, who's been my real estate partner for the last 16 years. He had Tony sitting there. He said, what do you want to do? And I started telling him. And then he started educating me. And it would be like, what do you want to do now? And I'm like, I want to do spirits. And then he had somebody there from spirits and we would talk about it and we should start building. Cause I trusted him, mm. right? Mm. And I trusted, um, and he explained things to me in a way that I could understand, right? You so there was you no judgment. You felt confident yeah. talking to him. It was no judgment. Mm. You know what I'm saying? It was yeah. no, okay, you don't understand it. That's cool. Let me just get somebody that can talk to you about this, right? And I tell people now, which is the craziest thing ever because I hated school. I really did, you know what I'm saying? I was trying to figure it out, you know, take care of my mom and my sister. And, um, but nowadays, I'm like a sponge. I'll sit there and learn all day, bro. Like, top, top of the day to the bottom of the day, I'm trying to learn something new. Because I'm fascinated by it, right? And I feel like I was a little bit behind the eight ball, so now I'm trying to catch up. But what I will say um, to anybody watching this, when you get people in your circle that you can trust, you know, you have to lean into that because we all don't know everything, bro. Some of us are great earners. Some of us are great leaders. Mm -hmm. um, some of us are great soldiers. You know what I'm saying? But if you lack something, you have to have somebody in your circle that you can actually trust that can put you on game because that can be the def that could be the difference between you having, you know, a flash in the pan or, or, or having, you know, generational real wealth where it changes not only your life, it changes the people around you lives, right? And that was the difference he was able to explain to me. He was able to have those conversations that I was open and honest. When you tell another grown man you ain't got a bank account, you know, <laughs> that's it. That's a real conversation. You know, for damn, real. But damn, you got four Lamborghinis. <laughs> got to talk about that. All <laughs> you know cash, homie. All cash. You know what I'm saying? I got the titles. <laughs> you know yeah, yeah, yeah. You said that, and this is interesting, right? You, you, you get information. Right. At that point, you didn't really understand. But you said you had like 100 soldiers running with you. Right. So now as you're getting the information, are you feeling as a leader of your crew, right. to say, all right, I got this information. Right. Let me pass it down to y'all. Or right. is it, I got to figure this out for myself first before I can pass it down to y'all? Well, I think just being all honesty, I, I don't think that's what they cared about. Mm. You know what I'm saying? People contribute what they can. And sometimes, you know, I can't speak for everybody, but sometimes people are good with just the partying and the hanging out and the living. Like, they're not I'm in it for that, right? Yeah. It's, it's just like you can't get all your friends and bring them on the football field when you go to the, to the, to the Super Bowl. Like, they, you know, I'd rather be in the stands and watch you, you know, cheer you on, but I don't want to be going to practice, you yeah. know, doing yeah, that. You know what I mean? I don't, yeah. don't want to do all the stuff. I don't want to train and all that. And, and no disrespect to anyone, you know, my vision has always been my vision. I just came from where I came from, mm -hmm. right? And I had a lot of things that came with me in the beginning that probably didn't even understand where I was going because that wasn't the type of conversation we was having. When you sit down yeah. with somebody, you tell me a vision, like in 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, I want to be here, I want to do this, I want this type of circle, uh, I want this type of movement or this type of understanding, 
You know, a lot of people might be like, all right, cool, that ain't for me, bro. I'm about to go to Magic City. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Get some wings. I holler at you. You know what I mean? Because that takes work, you That's know, and, and everybody ain't with that. And for me, I think the hardest part was um, staying disciplined and staying dedicated to what the vision was because even when I was on in rap, you know what I'm saying, and, and, and shout out to my brother Nip, you know, I still had those same consequences to deal with, right? Or that same type of environment to be around, which is why when I even looked at it, I'm going like, damn, like, it almost feels like to me that rap is the new streets. Yeah, you did all that to escape it. <laughs> and then so it came right it. back to you. <laughs> yeah. So now I got to do it all The same consequences. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, but, but now you're doing it, and you're doing it in a way that you're not just in your city and your hood. You're around the world. Yeah, and everybody knows you. Right. And they know where you're going to be. Exactly. <laughs> you right, know what I'm right, saying? Right. They know what you're coming to do. And, and it, just, it, it just got a little tricky. And I'm going to be honest with you. Like, it's hard to stay disciplined with all the temptation. And, 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 and one thing I pride myself on is my discipline and my consistency, right? And my belief, right? And even when I was hanging around guys that were going and buying Ferraris every other week and all that, and I'm still riding around in my, we call them work cars, my Grand Prix and all this stuff. But I had a bigger vision. I'm like, Shit, you know, I, I got 10 cars. Like, I don't need to buy any more cars. Let me go put the money in the studio, put the money in myself, like brand myself. And this is before I knew what branding was. I'm buying jerseys. Shout out to Exclusive Game. He's doing all my jerseys. I'm yeah, getting yeah, a chain with my name on it. <laughs> yeah. I wasn't good when the feds were watching me, You know what I'm saying? But I had... You know, because I'm trying to brand myself. So when we all go to Magic City spending money, I'm not looking at how everybody else is looking at it. Everybody's having a good time. In my mind, this is part of the plan. Yeah. So I got to be strategic. Like, I got I, I got a budget. They don't even know that. You know what I'm saying? Like, you <laughs> know mean, what I mean? I'm like, I'm going to spend 100000 tonight, but I know what that means. <laughs> not a dollar spend over. another 100000 no, on Friday. Don't Because I got to be consistent. You yeah. know what I'm saying? But Make I'm sure not they going, play the I'm record. Not, but I'm not, right. But yeah. I'm not going in there like, you know, I got to go get, with a stripper, I ain't even thinking like. Well, that. the crazy thing is, the first time I really, when I started to catch into your wave, I used to, I was in school in Maryland, Baltimore, and I think I used to play ball, and I got hurt, and um, I was on the bike, and I'm riding the bike, and MTV came on, hmm. and it was like, um, hottest rapper in the south, Young Jeezy, and they had you with the bandana in Magic City, one of these strip clubs with the the shirt on, snowman, and you was throwing money. Right. And that's when I seen it. And they was like, and that was the image where it was like, this dude is just coming out, but he spending money like he's Jay Z or something right. like. You know what I'm saying? Like the money that he's spending is like Birdman, something like right. that. And so it's crazy. This is a full circle moment. Actually, I just remembered that. Yeah. That that was part of your marketing plan because right. in Baltimore, when I was in Baltimore at that time, <laughs> riding on a on a bike, yeah. I saw it. Yeah. And I'm like, all right. And then shortly after the album comes out, then the whole world gets yeah. to know you. I, I think even from a business standpoint, to that time, I remember seeing Boys in the Hood first. Right. And that was off, like in New York. It was like, oh, wait, who's, who's the guy that, right. that, in that right. song with the bandana? Right. And then it was like, wait, he's not with them. He's over here doing his own thing. Right. I'm like, all right, how did he structure that? You know what I mean? Like for us, it was like, how did he structure the business wow. to be like, oh, he's with Puff over there, but right. he's Jay actually over Jay yeah. over here. I mean, well, well, you got to think about it. When I went in, I made sure that I was able to stand on my own, too. So I was the one that was calling the shots, making the decisions. Mm -hmm. But I also understood that if I can be in business with Jay-Z and Puffy at the same time, that would make me different, right? And shout out to Kim Porter and my sister um, Ebony, because they the ones, that, and Block as well, they the one came Block. to me about yeah, the yeah. Boys in the Hood thing. Yeah. But I, I told him, I said, look, you know, I told Puff, you know, Cause one night Puff was calling me trying to get me to go to Kinko's and sign the contract. And I'm walking in Magic City. I'm like, yeah, my man. You At one o'clock in the morning. I swear to God. You know, like, I, I you know I'm going to work, God, right? Those like Bibles. And you call me, I'm like, yo, man, I'm about to go in Magic. You know what I'm saying? That's, like, that's, that's the and I'm going in Magic because I'm still staying on my consistency because I'm knowing Magic is 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 the cesspool of all the hustlers around the world, all the athletes, and all the made women. And if I can go in there and I can be consistent, I can build a brand for myself. But going back to your question about um, Jay and Puff, I couldn't turn down that opportunity because I'm like, I got a relationship with Jay-Z and L.A. Reid. I can negotiate this myself. Mm -hmm. So I basically went in and said, look, I'll do the album, but I'm only going to do one album because they tried to get me to do three. And I says, what y'all going to give me for, 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 for three albums? I need that for one. And that's the way I negotiated the deal. And I remember Jay called me, boy. He's like, yeah, you smart. And I was like, yeah. 
And I did it, and I pushed my album back um, to July 26th, yep. one month, so that the Boys in the Hood album could come out. Because I understood in my mind that that was a bigger promo play. No disrespect to them, but I'm saying, like, if I let that album go first, and then my debut album comes after that, that's just more momentum going into what I'm doing. You feel what I'm saying? Yeah, it's perfect setup. It's perfect setup, yeah. right? And I did it myself. Even yeah. L.A. Reid called me, he's like, boy. You know what I'm saying? Like, like, boom, boom, right. clap. Yeah, boom, that was it. Boom, clap. And with that being said, it was like, you know, and I talk about it a lot in the book, it's like, I was doing that under the most extreme pressure you could think of, bro. You know what I'm saying? Because my world was, it was like the wild, wild west, bro. Everything and anything was happening. You know what I'm saying? And I had, I was under the most pressure, but that's when I learned. Like somebody called me there, I was just telling them, like, I'm, I'm, I'm better when it's chaos. Because I sit in it and everything slows down for me. And I go, okay, well, if I do this, that, 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 that makes sense. I'm a visionary and I'm a disruptor. That's, that's how I see it. I can get it done if I can, if I can feel it. If it's too calm, then I'm concerned, <laughs> right? And what I learned throughout, you know, my career is that when I have these visions and I see things and I go out and execute them, some type of way God just puts certain people in my path that I, that I interact with to give me the other pieces that I don't have. Right, and, and, and one of those was Puff. One of those was Jay, because I needed that more than anything. Like Kevin Lyle signed me, and he left like two weeks after he signed me. He was the president. Mm. I'm like, I need to be going with you. And he like, because he went to Atlantic. Mm -hmm. He like, no, you're going to be good. Def Jam's good for you, you're going to be good. Next week, I'm going to the Def Jam. I run into Jay-Z in the lobby. He like, yo, let's go upstairs, man. You know I'm the new president. I'm like, what? Oh, this is crazy. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I got this song I need you on. Yeah, this don't blow right, right. Go crazy. And, and that's what happened. That's how I got oh, you. That's, that's how the yeah, go crazy yeah, happened? That's how it happened. Because we met on our own. I, I met Jay-Z going in. Jay-Z pulled up. I'm going in the building. 100 people with me. He like, you can come up with me. They got to check in. And I walked up with him, and we just had a conversation. He's like, whatever you need, I'm here. And I was like, as a matter of fact, <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? I got That's, this record. Yeah, Mariano yeah. Mariano. He, gave right. you one, he gave you one of his best verses yeah. too. Yeah, and, and I think that Mariano. came from um, I think that came from our mutual respect for each other. Because a lot of people don't know, like me and Jay have been down for a lot of years, but we rarely talk about music. It's more so about life, what we're trying to do, what moves we want to make, and how we see. Shit. And for me. You know, I think that's important to be able to have somebody that's like-minded that you can like throw ideas back and forth with. Because sometimes you can have people around that can't see that far, and that's not their fault, right? Mm -hmm. But they, but they can't. And when you say these, I mean, because I, I go back, you know, when I was first started rapping, people was like, "Man, you crazy? There's no way that's gonna work." And I didn't understand that. I'm like, why? Right? And as I started to, you know, to start to to see some success, I started to understand it more. Of course, I didn't have all the pieces to the puzzle, but they started to slowly come. They started to slowly come. I started to understand what marketing was. That's where the snowman came from, the branding. You know what I'm saying? How do I make this, how do I immortalize this? You know what mm -hmm. I mean? How do I take this from just being Jeezy or young Jeezy to something else? And that's where the snowman came from. And then the, the passing out, you know, a lot of people don't know that. I passed out maybe over a million between Streets is Watching and Trap or Die, a million CDs. That I paid for myself and gave away all free music. When everybody told me that was like the dumbest shit in the world, <laughs> you know what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah. And I was just like, nah, this is gonna work. And I kept doing it. And the first show I got was um, was at this club called Prime uh, on the East Side. It paid me two hundred dollars. Two hundred? Two hundred? I couldn't even put no gas in my Ferrari. It was crazy. <laughs> you can't use Oh, you had a Ferrari and got paid two hundred? I'm trying to tell you. <laughs> You should just tell like keep that what happened on the boys in the hood thing. You know, we do it the show is it's four four or five of us. You know what I'm saying? It's a thousand dollars, not a piece together. Total. Bust it down. Right, bust it down. I'm like, man, y'all just, you know, y'all keep that. Right. Keep your bandana. Go, right. <laughs> and some socks. You know what I mean? Keep it too. But 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 I, I wanted to be there for them, right? And I and I believed in what we was doing. It's honorable. And it wasn't about the money. And I was just so excited to be on the stage and people were actually, not that it was a big crowd. But it was, you know, you might got two chicks in the front row, one guy who might know you from the club. That's my boy. That was it. That was the only people moving. Everybody else conversating and doing whatever. But I was just like, yo, I got a fan. 
I got somebody that's rocking with me. That's all I cared about. But even more important than that was the content. Like I said, when I seen, it was a lot of footage that was coming out right. at that time. And then, of course, you know, with BMF and everything. So right. it was like, sometimes you do things, it's not about the money, but it is about the content. Right. But I want to ask you about marketing. You, you mentioned it. What was your thought process? I remember the can't ban the snowman campaign. Right. When they tried to ban. So you, you have the logo. Right. You had the T-shirts. Right. You've done something that corporate, they always say you should you should rebrand yourself every five years. So right. you start as Young Jeezy. Right. Then it's just started G- Lil J. Lil J. Yep. Then to Young Jeezy. To Young Jeezy. To Jeezy. To Jeezy. Now to J. Jeezy Jenkins. Now to J. Jeezy Jenkins. Yeah. So talk about all of that. Like, was that something that you had to learn or is right. this just in you to know that, you know, it's I think marketing? it's I think it's in me. In me and not on me. I think that going back to your thing about branding that Content, what you just said. I didn't know what content was. You know what I'm saying? I'm not going. But what I did have is a camera guy that was running around with me from time to time, right? And I saw the Smack DVDs, and I'm like, hold up. And I'm like, maybe I should do my own. So when I do this mixtape, I'm going to put a DVD with it. So I hooked up with these guys, I think it was Raw Report, and I had all this footage, and I was like, yo, put a put this documentary style thing together for me so I could release it with my mixtape. Because the problem that I was running into when I was doing these little club dates was nobody knew who I really looked like. You know what I'm saying? Like the they, music. Yeah, they just knew the music. And when I knew I was on the summers, when I used to go to my homies' trap houses, like on the west side, east side, or whatever, and they would be sitting in there watching this shit. I'm just like, I don't know me. This is crazy. This is weird. I gotta get out the trap house. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's gotta go. They would, it would be on the screen. Sorry. Like they'd be in the account money doing their thing, but they would actually be watching the DVD and be like blown away. And I was just like, damn. So maybe they just showed me love. But as I started moving around the world, I started to understand that like, nah, people are really accepting this because the music is reflecting. Because your audio got to match your video, mm-hmm. right? You know what I'm saying? If you're saying one thing and doing another, it, it doesn't make sense, right? Mm-hmm. And the audio matched the video. So that's when I under, started to understand about like branding. But to answer your question, it's like, for me, it's like when I came, started in the streets, I already knew that I had, my goal wasn't to become a kingpin that was Pablo Escobar. It was just to maintain what I could and save what I could till I figured out how to get into something else that I wouldn't have while I had less, less risk involved, right? And that just happened to end up being music. But then I knew when I got into music that I'm still, okay, what's the lifespan of somebody who does that, right? So that means I'm gonna have to grow up in this mm-hmm. shit. But, but, but the bigger picture is I'm gonna have to elevate and evolve. And how do I do that? I do that by bringing people on my journey with me, right? So as I'm going through these phases and you're seeing different things, I went from bandanas to fedoras to this to that, because I'm, I'm just, I'm experiencing what I'm experiencing. I'm growing up in a culture where people just want you to be what they saw you as the first time. And if that's the case, I'll still be walking around in a, in a 4X t-shirt and some 46, <laughs> so you 46 the ways, right? <laughs> it's a baby names. It's like, you feel what I'm saying? Yeah, if that's yeah. the case, right? Yeah. It's like, no, nah, you, you, you have to go. Because music, just doing music or being from the streets, I've seen some of the flies, uh, 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 trap guys you probably know. And they low key, they drive, Audis, they're not even flossy. They just got the right watch. You know what I'm saying? They're not even, you wouldn't even know, right? Mm -hmm. And I respected that. And I'm like, damn, like, how do you go from people knowing you from wearing, you know, millions of dollars worth of jewelry, driving, you know, the most ignorant color car you can get, you know what I'm saying? (laughs) You know, all these things to to evolving. So it's almost like you got to challenge yourself and those levels you see me go through is when I was actually growing. And that didn't mean the culture was going to accept that. But I was trying to get to JGZ Jenkins. You, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. It was like the whole, because I wasn't content with just the music part. I'd already, you know, I already had solved that puzzle. You know what I'm saying? You know, you get platinum plaques on your wall like, and you're not fulfilled. That means that when you'll stop. I love it. I love what I do. I love the way that I'm able to, to influence and connect with my culture. But then that's not the last stop for me. You'll never hear my kids say my dad was a great artist. Dad has to be a great man, right? So now I got to continue on that, that journey. So all these different phases you're seeing is me actually growing up in this shit. Because you got to wonder what Pac would be if he was still right. around. Because yeah. he was already ahead of his time. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, so it's yeah. like, what, what and who would he be, right? And I look at myself like that because I'm still growing, I'm still learning, but I have um, embodied what it is to be from the streets 
and to be what it is to be, you know, um, um, quote unquote, a trap star, to what it is to be a best-selling author, to what it is to be a grown-ass man, right? And all these things that happen with culture, with a sixth grade education, GED in jail, you know what I'm saying? And now you got somebody who sits around all day and all you want to do is learn. Yeah. You know, it sounds crazy, <laughs> you know what yeah. I'm saying? But still evolving and showing the culture, like, look, bro, you can't allow these people to box you in and just tell you you got to be a certain way because that's where you came from. Or you got to live a certain way because that's all you know, right? And the sad part about it is we spend so much time trying to outdo each other instead of spreading the knowledge and the game that, you know, because once, once everybody's on the same page and you're really out here, you know, making moves and, and able, it, it's no different from the streets. Now we all looking out for each other because there's no scarcity, right? And the thing I had to learn is like, you know, back then I was living out of fear. You know, nowadays I'm living out of love. Like I don't, like I'm, I'm not, there's no, no scarcity here. Like if I lost it all tomorrow, I get it back. I know how, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, so that's not that. And so a lot of the things that I did back then that really didn't serve me, um, it was out of fear. And nowadays it's out of love. So when you see me showing my growth and my evolution, it's out of love. It's like, look, bro, you know, this because it, it ain't no different when I got in the game. You think a lot of these cats, they came from the street stutter in the rap, really wanted to do that. They like, man, I used to stand on the block with Jeezy, bro. I know damn well if he can go out here and sell a million records and do this shit, I can. And when I came in the door, I left it cracked. I didn't lock it. And it's the same thing what I'm doing right now. The door is still cracked. Mm. You feel what I'm saying? Y'all want to come in, you can. If you don't, just keep it moving. This is a Fast Financial Fact, sponsored by Xfinity. This week's fact, high interest debt, like credit card debt, can be significant financial burden. Paying it down as quickly as possible is essential for financial health and freedom. In some cases, credit counseling agencies can set up debt management plans that consolidate your debt and provide structured affordable repayment schedule. However, be cautious. The industry is rife with scams and fraudulent services that promise debt relief, but ultimately take advantage of vulnerable individuals. Stay away from any service that requires upfront fees or guarantees debt reduction. Assets Over Liabilities is presented by Xfinity. So that, that evolution is important. Yeah. I feel like we, we didn't get to see that with Big and Pop, yeah. but to see it happen with you and guys like Ross mm -hmm. and Tip, mm -hmm. it's important, right? Because yeah. we got to grow with you. Even from a physical standpoint, I remember the guy with the big shirt, yeah. then it became the guy with the tank top. Right. right? And now, now it's like there's a polished right. aura to you now. Right. I wonder at what point in this evolution did you now feel comfortable having the business conversation. So when they bring mm. you to the spirits, mm. when they bring you to Defiance Water or, mm. to, or to Nod, at what point in the evolution were you now comfortable, right? Mm. Before it was, I, I'm not sure what that meant, let me go look it up to, now right. I'm walking in this fully confident. Right, right. Well, two things. The first thing is the, the polished version you see is, is what I always wanted my mother to see because I know I could be that. Like, that's what I strive for every day of my life. I just want to be the best version of myself every day. You know what I'm saying? Because if I'm the best version of myself, that means the people around me are gonna strive to be the best version of themselves. And that way, that's our common synergy. That's how we locked in. Because we just want to do better and look out for each other. So that was a, a, a big thing for me. But when you speak on confidence, is I lost enough, and I lost enough money on my own to learn things the way I had to learn them, like trial and trial. It's almost like somebody who teaches themselves how to play golf. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. you just, you've been out there on the course long enough, you just learn it, right? And for me, when I started learning that I had a, I had a, 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 what do I call it, like a gift of being a visionary and a disruptor, that helped me out a lot because now when I sit in these rooms and I'm hearing these conversations, I'm taking in the information and I'm processing it, but there's no emotion tied to it, right? Mm. So along with those gifts, my other gift is problem solving. Right? Because if I got to get something from Texas to Atlanta, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And the vans are hot. Maybe not a problem. Out <laughs> but I'm like, hmm, okay, we'll do that. And it's in a split second because I can make that decision because I got enough confidence in myself and I know how to problem solve because that's a gift that I have. So when I started going in these meetings and listening to everybody talk, it's always a sense of scarcity. Somebody's scared to lose their job. Somebody's scared to look crazy in front of the boss. Somebody's scared that they just got a promotion and not going to be able to come up with the answer and all that, and it's all this pressure, and they're not thinking. You know, if you ever did a brain scan, you'll know, like, when you're under pressure, you, 
your brain gets less oxygen, you, you, all these different hormones come out like you're not at your best because it's pressure zone. But that's my gift. <laughs> when the pressure's on, I can sit there and go, it's like Neo in the Matrix, bro. I see it slow motion, I grab that, grab this. And I sit down and say, yo, listen, this is what we're gonna do. And, and just to show you that, I remember me and Jay-Z had a clothing line. It was called uh, USDA, United Streets and Doughboys of America. Remember that? Oh, Jay-Z was involved with that? Yeah, he helped me get it with yeah. the guys that own uh, uh, Rockaway, the okay. two Russian guys. Okay. And I remember I was in Miami partying you know, I was living in La Vila Loca, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and my phone rang and it was, it was Hove. And he said, yo, the guys want to talk to you. And I said, oh, what's the problem? You know, I'm poolside. I said, yo, what's going on? He's like, oh, my God, the government called. They, they, they put a cyst in the cyst on the USDA. It's over. We got to wrap all this stuff up. We're going to lose millions and millions and millions. And I go, hold up. No, we're not. I said, this is what we're going to do. We're going to change it to 8732 because those are the same numbers that you use when you paid somebody and paid somebody back then. And it means the same thing, mm -hmm. right? It means USDA put in numbers. And this was like a two minute conversation. Like after they called me like frantic and I'm just like, nah, we're just going to change it to numbers. You ever seen when you text somebody, when you beep somebody back and you know how you beep people 911, that means <laughs> HOE, that means that, you know what I'm saying? I'm like, we're going to do 8732. And I hung the phone and they called me back. He was like, man, you're Jeez. I said, no, I'm not. I'm just calm. You know? It's like, it's cool. It's not a problem. I don't want to hear the problem. I want to hear the solution. And it would be instances like that that just showed me how to maneuver because when you're dealing with people and everything is caught up in this one deal, this one situation, they're not normally thinking clearly, bro. You know what I'm saying? They're, they're, they're under stress. And it's just like, that doesn't work because if I ever did, when I was in the streets, if I did every deal I did with stress, somebody's going to get shot. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? What I'm saying? Like, it's it's too much. It's too much. That's the consequence. It's like, you got to hold on. Well, Dane, Dane told us that. Dane told us, shout out to Dane, he was like, um, he never does business with anybody that's in a, a state of, how do you put it? Survival mode. Yeah. yeah. He was like, because once you're in survival mode, you, you rationalize anything. Right. You can rationalize the most foulest acts like, I got to feed my family. I got to feed my but daughter. That's the, that's, the, that's the fear and love thing. Fear would be the scarcity of losing something, right? Love would be, I actually love the problem solve. Like, I love this. Like, this is not a thing to me. You feel what I'm saying? Like, when my team calls me about something, I just got to hear it one time. I'd be like, all right, cool. Well, let's just do this. You know what I'm saying? And don't even give it no more thought because I know that that's going to that's gonna be, because I'm speaking out of love, I want to make, make this situation that seems like it's the end of the world better for them. Right? Let me ask you this. So, speaking of business. Yes. I see we have the spirits. Yeah, nah, nah, nah. nah. Vodka gin, <laughs> the finest few, some old still right <laughs> somewhere, yeah. Stay so, hydrated. So now <laughs> it's not, but you started with Avion, mm -hmm. tequila. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Actually, I started with Grey Goose. As an ambassador? Yes. Okay. And so, then Ciroc. Ciroc boy? Puff trick the shit out of me. <laughs> I said it in the song. He was just like, yo, I got this check for you. I was like, man, I can't. Can I be a Ciroc man? I can't be nobody's boy. <laughs> I can't be nobody's boy. <laughs> You're like, yo, just take the money, man. <laughs> <laughs> take some money. And, right, the, you and the jacket. Yeah, I didn't get a jacket. <laughs> I, I was wearing CTE jackets. I didn't win here. I was walking around with that shit. <laughs> so, I'm talking about your journey in, this, in the spirits industry from being an ambassador to right. being an investor owner. Well, like, well I'll, that... I'll tell you where it started. Like, you know, um, when I grew up, my mother, uh, she, worked as a, she, she worked as a maid, and then she got a cosmetology license, and she was um, a hairdresser for a while. And every Friday she got paid. She you from go, Macon, Georgia? No, this my mom's from Hawkersville, Georgia. Oh, you're from Macon, though, right? No, 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 no. Just you know, it's long history. We'll talk okay, about okay, it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to Macon, though. Um, <laughs> that's what my job was. That's what my job. You know what I'm saying? With benefits. Um, so my mom used to take me to the to the uh, liquor store every Friday when she got paid, and everybody used to be out there. And everybody sit around drinking, cast their checks, get to the liquor store, people 20% of it, 10%, whatever, and sit out there, drink their polymer and all that. And I never really understood what alcohol was, right? And of course, you know, I had my own stint with it. And I started to just understand, like, this is a real thing, right? This is like something that people do, right? Celebratory, some people use it for other things or whatever. And I just seen the impact it had, right? So 
as I came into my thing, when I hit my low points, and I talk about that in the book as well, I, I leaned into alcohol a lot too. You know what I'm saying? And to the, to the point so much so that, you know, I had to really pull myself out of a dark hole, right? Of alcoholism? Yeah, because, you know, I, that's how I was self-soothing, right? Because things were happening around me so much that, you know, it, it, and coming from the trauma that I already had to this new trauma, that like, you know, it just it, it just kept me calm. You know what I'm saying? It was something that I would do, you know, at 2 o'clock in, in the afternoon, I'm sipping out a red cup. You know what I'm saying? And I still got the rest of the night to go. <laughs> <laughs> just get started. Right, just get started. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's 6 Pre o'clock somewhere. <laughs> Pre <-cats up. laughs> right. And, and I started to notice that. But then I also started to notice, you know, the people who did it to a high level, how that brought, you know, how they celebrated with it. And I'm like, okay, well, it could be that too. Right? And I started off, and um, Great Goose got me this deal, which was a cool deal. We did this campaign, and we went to... Um, New York shot this whole thing where I'm like with the confetti and the flag and it was like this American. And I I did it in New York and I didn't think nothing about it. And then I remember start going to like Onyx and all these different strip clubs and I would see it in there. I'm like, then how they get in here? Cause I'm thinking I got the check. This is in New York, this is gonna stay up here, but now this is following me. And I'm like, damn, why is it following me? And what happened was I went to them one day and I was doing this party at this club called Velvet Room. I was like, yo, I'm doing this party. It's gonna be crazy, everybody's gonna be there. I'm gonna need about, you know, like 40 bottles and whatever. Sent me two bottles. I was like, I could have bought this, right? So yeah. that told me right then and there, they didn't understand the culture part. They didn't value you. Right, and they didn't understand the culture part. So when I got out of that deal, um, I was, uh, I forget what I was doing, and I did Super Freak uh, around that time. And, you know, the last night I was on Cush and Ciroc. And you know, to me, it was without somebody had put me on some what's it, coconut syrup? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And at the time, I thought I was drinking some. It was uh, you know, because I was trying to get healthy. So I was like, oh, I ain't mixing it with nothing. I ain't gonna <laughs> syrup and all this. Shit, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but I was I was drinking it and straight, and it, straight, and it was like it was good. And I was like, you know, and I rapped the song, or whatever, because it was a fun night. I did a song, or whatever, and like maybe like five, six months later, Puff called me. You're like, yo, you gotta be a Ciroc boy. I was like, I, well, what's, you know, what's going on? And he was like, yo, you know, the song you did, Super Freak, and da da da. And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But in my mind, you know, I always shout out what I'm doing. So I never thought about it like that. And then, uh, of course, he, he said, the Ciroc boy thing. I was like, nah, I can't. <laughs> I was like, you know, we gotta figure out another name for you. Right? <laughs> That's not gonna work. And um, he's like, yeah, right, cool, we'll figure it out. Just take the money, right? And I was just like, nah, I want the money. He's like, no, nah, but you gotta take the money. Right, because I need you to be down with what I'm doing. And I was like, all right, let's figure it out. So him and my business manager, they worked it out. And then I was like, cool, because Puff was my guy. So it was like, whatever. And then um, we did that for a while. And uh, I stopped drinking vodka for a minute, right? And and, uh, and I started back drinking tequila. And what I was drinking was uh, uh, Patron. And one day, i never forget, I was out to dinner with some people. And my man said, have you ever tried this? It was in the restaurant. I was like, no, what's that? It was Avion. And I was like, let me try it. You know, he let me take a shot of it. I was like, this is good. Same thing. I went back to the studio. Dude, that Patron, we own that Avion. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and the guy, shout out, who's one of my mentors and great friends right now, uh, Ken Austin, hit me up. And he's like, yo, you should come in and talk to me. Now, mind you, true story, me and Nipsey Hussle had been talking a lot. Then, because I was trying to take him over to Atlantic Records. And um, we were just talking about uh, having ownership and residuals and all. That was the conversation we had. And this was around the same time. So when I went and sat down with Ken, you know, you know, he, he, you know, he, he, he's a rock star. He talked that talk. And I'm just like, yeah, that's all good. I was like, uh, yeah, I'll do it. But, uh, you know, because he was trying to pay me, same thing. Like, Puff, I was like, nah, I ain't taking no more money. I put my likeness to it. You know what I'm saying? I gotta be in it. And he said, uh, what do you need? I said, when are you planning to sell? He said, five years. I said, I'll tell you what, don't give me a dime, right? Give me, give me some ownership in it, and we'll come back in five years and you see what I've done. Now, mind you, I already seen that he had it and all the high-end stuff. So all the big hotels and all that, big restaurants. But he didn't have that. And at that time, I was doing one of the most legendary club runs, <laughs> you know what I'm saying, of all. And all I had to do was just bring this with me and do what I do. And I told him, I said, yo, I got to have some equity in it. And mind you, it's me and Nipsey talking. I didn't, 
you know, I didn't know he was going to be cool with it. He said, let me think about it. He called me back, man. He said, yeah, man. I, he said, let's do it. I said, all right, cool. So we did the deal five years. It went as planned. You know, I got out here. I bust my ass. Um, got it everywhere it needed to be. Watched the culture shift with it. And it was great product, too. So I didn't, wouldn't put my name behind something I didn't believe in. And when it was five years, we sat down at the table and Pernod Ricard came and cut that check. And it was, you know. <laughs> I know what to do with checks now. Yeah, you feel me? So I was just like, yeah. And then also I got a 10-year buyout in it. You know what I'm saying? So for, ten, for the next 10 years after we sold our shares, I still get paid. You know what I'm saying? You get paid so, residual income. Residual, residual income. income. So to me it made sense. But, but not only that, you know, because everything is not always about the money. I learned the game from Ken because Ken went on to do uh, Terramono with The Rock and mm. uh, 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 Proper 13 with Conor McGregor. Like, he's like one of my, my good friends and mentors. You know, we still talk to this day. And that's when I went on to do Nod, you know what I'm saying? Which is a, um, a family, a five generation family of distillers out in Cognac, France. And this is our brand together. And the reason why I went with Nod, because I believe in the brand, it matches my lifestyle. We got vodka, we got four different renditions of a Cognac and we got gin. Right, and then we got the Defiance Fuel to top it off with. Shout out to Defiance Fuel. Yeah, Just so the, 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 the water is part of the... No, 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 the Defiance Fuel is a Completely total, separate. It's completely separate. And, um, you know, that was that was the thing. Because for me, I do things that are part of my lifestyle that I understand, right? As you see, I'm a cigar smoker. I love Cubans. That goes well with cognac. If I want to turn up a little bit, you know what I'm saying? I do a little vodka. I do gin every now and then, but don't hang out with me those days because it's getting a little crazy. <laughs> Um, but, you know, it has to go with who I am because I don't want to go out here peddling things that I don't believe in. And then also the people that I love to have um, a business relationship with, right? Because, you know, if you think about it, this little kid that was 13, 14 with his mom, watching her and three, four of her friends pull in for a fifth of Paula Masson, you know, that's just one bottle. You tell my people go work a whole week just to have one bottle. and as you look at this, this is pretty much a liquor store. <laughs> so to me, that's, that's, that's an accomplishment, right? Mm -hmm. Because I know how hard people work just to celebrate life and celebrate themselves on the weekend. And I want to give them something that makes them feel like that week, week was worth it, right? I drink responsibly, but you know, when you feel like celebrating, this, this, is, this is what I'm on. Like, that's this is how I'm living my life. The enough. same thing with, you know, to tequila, you know, I, I've since changed from those days, so, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm, a, I'm on a cognac now. <laughs> one, one of the things that's definitely part of your life now is real estate. Yes. And that's a, it's a, a, a great asset class. I remember during the Versus Battle, you, you said that, you know, I own half of Atlanta, yeah. and people kind of like, oh, we looked it up, his name's not on anything, right. because they didn't understand the education behind right. not putting your personal name on, on owning property. What they did is make me tighten up because I had one property that was in, that was in my name <laughs> that I had to hurry up and get out because when I was in a lawsuit, they were trying to take that shit up. Like, oh my God, I should have held up on that bar. But people have to know you never put nothing in your name. You have to have LOCs, trust, you name it, because you have to protect yourself, especially when you're a public figure. But if you're a regular person, you still have to protect, protect your assets. And I just... I think that that showed the state of the culture when people thought that they can really go Google <laughs> what, I know. what you own. Like. But I appreciate the fact that you really didn't even respond. Right. You just kind of, all right, well, let them educate themselves. What kind of right. opened the door for us to now right. say, right. well, here's why he, it's not in his name. Could right? you explain to him? So <laughs> <laughs> it was on me for a minute. I'm like, we got some experts in the building. My man's going to tell y'all. So explain to me why I wouldn't put it in my name so I could, we can explain to them. Well, you don't, you don't want to have your, your personal name on anything for the, right. the simple fact that it's a liability. So right. if, if there's any type of lawsuit or any type of case where things are being seized, you don't want your personal mm -hmm. property to be taken. That's why you create an LLC. And some people create an LLC for each property right. that they have, or right. you can create a property management group where you're going to have those properties inside right. of. So it's really to protect you from your personal assets, from your business assets. And it's also so, a protection thing, too. People know where you live. Right. And that's a security issue. Right. So you 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 eliminate that by putting it in an LLC or a trust. And then if it's in the trust, then you get tax benefits. Right. Yep. And we'll talk about a trust in a minute. But for all my guys out there in street land, it's equivalent to putting your condo or your apartment and your uncle or your mama name so the police come <laughs> they don't come take your shit. 
it's the same thing. <laughs> and this was a message brought Just to you so by. Just so we clear. <laughs> yeah. But it was crazy. Yeah. And, and, and the fact that, you know, people would challenge that is, is fascinating to me because I'm, say, I'm not saying that from a bragging right, but that's the only thing that I got to stand on because that's what matters to me. Again, I told you I grew up in a trailer that wasn't bigger than this room. Mm -hmm. $3,500 I paid for my mother's trailer, right? The first house we lived in. You know what I'm saying? And for me, like dirt, and we was talking about stocks and stuff earlier, like, but nothing means as much as dirt to me, right? Because if anything ever happened, my kid's gonna always have somewhere. If if anything ever happened, I mean, the world can go, you know, to sh you know what I'm saying? But this is something that, that, that we have, right? And to me, you know, some people like, you know, tech, some people like, you know, stocks, some people like, you know, bonds, whatever, but to me, like, real estate, when you come from where I come from, where nobody ever really owns is the biggest thing in the world. When I say that, that I own half a land, I stand on that. Because I don't think there's anybody to do what I do that has, you know, a real estate portfolio like mine, right? And, and you know, car collections, maybe, you know what I'm saying? Like, but that ain't where I'm at, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? Like, I don't even drive half the I got. I'm just being, probably none of it. But that's not what's important to me. What's important to me is that Aside from the music, this is where I get my fulfillment from, mm -hmm. right? I love going out, seeing some property, acquiring it, you know, just seeing it, seeing the equity in it, just understanding what it means, you know, understanding what type of credit lines that open up for me because I got all these, I got all this equity in my stuff, and there's no better feeling, bro, because for me, it's it's the life that I came from. It's like except the product ain't. Product, <laughs> it's, it's, it's houses. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And it's apartment complexes, and it's this and it's that. You're putting and up me, a different type of bricks these days. Right. There you go. That's what I was trying to say. <laughs> uh, that's, that's a bar. <laughs> yeah. That's a bar. But to me, I, I think that that's my purpose. Right. My purpose is to go out here and not only lead by example. Because I remember I heard the saying that Jeezy told. You know, our kids to travel die I told his son to go to college. Mm. I never understood that, right? Mm. Doesn't matter, because I tell my son all the time, like, you know, we're gonna figure this out together. I'm, I'm with you. But at the same time, my purpose has always been to give whatever information I get back to the culture. Box it up, make it digestible for them so it's not nothing that's over their head. Because I don't want them to feel like I felt when I was that guy sitting in somebody's chair with you know million dollars worth of checks in my pocket, and not knowing what to do, because mm -hmm. that was like one of the lowest moments in my life of a month, right? Because mm -hmm. nobody wants to seem dumb, right? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And it's just like sometimes you got to give it to them in a way that they understand. And to me, it's just like everybody ain't meant to go into business. You know what I'm saying? Everybody ain't meant to be a marketer. Ain't everybody ain't meant to be, uh, 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 you know, uh, Wall Street. All these different things. But you know, for most of us, we understand how to make take some take make something out of nothing, right? And when you make that, and you got this capital, and you got this money, you might not trust the fact of putting it in stocks and all these different things because you don't understand that, right? But you understand how to go buy something because if you go to Louis and, and Dior and all, that, and you're spending all your money there. I mean, if your credit right, that same ten thousand dollars that you spent there could have put a down payment on a, a on a flipper down the street, if that's what you want, right? That's gonna get you all the DR you want when you when you get that going, and it can pay for itself, mm -hmm. right? But my thing is to pour that back into the culture because I believe that a lot of us don't think that we can actually own stuff like that, right? And to me, the bigger flex is to stand on that stage and tell people, no, this is, this is what's happening. You know what I'm saying? I, I don't I don't have ten million dollars in jewelry, nor do I want it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I do not. But I you know, you wanna talk about these these houses, this real estate portfolio, I would love to do that. You wanna talk about these brands that's gonna evaluate at a billion dollars in five, six, five, six or seven years, we could do that. Well, I wanna talk about this real estate a little bit more in depth, but I do have a question about, okay. I have two questions about the liquor. Mm -hmm. One, you you had struggles with alcoholism. Yes. Is there any conflict that you have with yourself internally selling alcohol, knowing that a lot of people in the community, right. like you, experienced it? I, I've asked my question. I've asked myself that, but I like to look at it like this. It's almost like um, anything um, can be bad if it's not in moderation. Food, for mm -hmm. instance, you know what I'm saying? Shopping, uh, for instance. Uh, too much water, 
Um, but I look at it like this. Um, I know my my I know there's a bigger umbrella, right? And the bigger umbrella is a lot of these things that I make, I take back and put into my community, right? Through Street Dreams Foundation and all the stuff I do for inner city kids. So it has to come from somewhere. And this is no different from when I was on the block. You know what I'm saying? I was doing what I had to do, but I was still putting back into the community, whether I was buying all the kids on the block, you know, school clothes or paying for their Christmas, like it had to come from somewhere. And I'm hoping that, you know, people who do indulge understand that this is not nothing to lean on, right? Frank responsibly. Frank responsibly. My next question is, we talked about Jay and Diddy a lot in this interview, mm -hmm. a few times, mentioned him a few times. Both of them have had substantial lawsuits. Jay sued Bacardi, I think, for like a billion. I think he won like $600 million. Wow. And Diddy is currently in a lawsuit with Diageo right. about racial discrimination mm -hmm. for his te tequila brand. But both of them also became billionaires because of right. liquor brands. Right. You know them both, both personally. Have you thought about how their situations, have that made you look at your corporate partners different? Have you like even thought about that process? Well, it does. I, I had a real intense conversation with Puff about that. Uh, me and Jay had a real intense conversation about uh, uh, title. So I, I do get that. And, and, the, and the thing is, when you deal, deal with people who don't understand culture, they do have their stance, right? Um, but that's why there's a court, you know what I'm saying, to deal with it. And hopefully, you know, we all learn from each other and don't have to go back down that road. But, you know, when you go into business with somebody, you go in, you know, you, you go in at peace, right? And you just want to do good business. It's like any relationship that you have, you, you just want to bring your best self, right? And the minute that you don't agree on something, um, we just have to sort through it. But I never really thought about it in a way that, you know, like, cause the Belvedere thing, I, I knew early on that, mm -hmm. that this wasn't gonna work. You know what I'm saying? The uh, the Ciroc thing, I mean, it was just for a small amount of time. The Avion thing, like one of the best deals I've ever been a part of because I learned so much. He 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 opened up. He showed me things that people don't normally show their business partners. He had my back in ways um, that you know most people wouldn't do at a record label. You feel what I'm saying? So I learned a lot, and there's always that synergy. And then he's someone that I can't speak enough. It's somebody, if I ever ran into that type of problem, I would probably talk to him first. This is what I have going on. This is what, how can we come to some type of resolution? You know what I'm saying? Before mm -hmm. I get a $600 million check, like, over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you, you, you talked about vision, right. and you just used the word valuation, billion dollar valuation. Yeah. I don't want to gloss over that. Yeah, so yeah. It, it talks about where we're headed with this from the spirits industry. You talked about the real estate portfolio. Mm. And I'm assuming that's going to be a billion dollar valuation, mm. but it maybe it comes from buying homes, but more likely it's going to come from having commercial real estate. For sure, and for so sure, that's the goal. Talk, talk about the process of going from right. starting at home to right. now. We need to have buildings. Yeah. Right. So for me, it's just like you know, I start I started small time, just like with everything else. I started and I started to move up the ranks, and as I accumulated more properties from uh, single families to duplexes to apartment complexes. So you name it, you know, my goal now, you know, I, I want to be one of the first young guys to have a skyscraper in Atlanta. You know what I'm saying? I want to be one of the first young guys to take uh, a whole, you know, three, four city blocks in, in, in midtown Atlanta and, 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 and build our own version of Atlantic Station, if you know what that is, um, you know. And to build up, you know what I'm saying? Because I think it represents, you know, where I came from and what I'm about you know, the bottom to the top, you know, coming from nothing and building the way up. And when you look up, it, it's just so much aspiration and inspiration in that. And it's just like, you know, it, this is one vision to have, you know, uh, you know, multiple city blocks and buildings and Buckhead and all that. But like, if I was to ever walk in the building <laughs> and know this is like 80 floors of, of my dream, that that's what I'm working towards. You know what I mean? And not just in one city, but Start in Atlanta and spread it out that way. That's 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 the bigger vision for me. Are you and having Are you having conversations with developers? Absolutely, absolutely having those conversations. I, I never forget my guy on the on the um, like a night spot in Buckhead, right? And it was probably one of the most popping night spots it was. But it was the same space, right? Same space. And I remember he came to me. He was like, "Yo, I got to close it down. Somebody just came and bought the property. And they're gonna build something there." And I was just like, "What are they gonna build there?" And as I ride past it today, it's a whole building, like it's a hotel. 
but it just made me think like, damn, this is the same space. They took the same amount of space and just build up. They're gonna know? do that with Rock Spot too, right? right? <laughs> you feel me? Yeah. So it's like they just build up, and 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 that's 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 how you gotta look at things. Like, how do you scale the same space? How do you maximize? Right. It could be a one family home or it could be a hundred story building. There you go. It's still the same. That's the way I look at it. And 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 that's 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 my business. Like when and when I when I get that, I'll definitely come talk about it to Invest Fest. Yeah. Yes, sir. And let us be investors in it. Yeah, absolutely. You think I, I was always thinking <laughs> of you, know, you first on my cutting. list. <laughs> Jesus, it's been a pleasure, Mark. And and we are actually in one of his properties too. So for all you yeah. naysayers out there, all yeah. you critical yeah, people, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> LLC short is what they call me. LLC yeah. short. <laughs> they know me in the trust office. They're like, yeah, Mr. Jenkins, we got you. Oh man, we, <laughs> that's a note to anybody out there. Don't put nothing in your name. I do mean that. Let me one last question. We had talked about trust. What you have children? Um, what's your thoughts on setting them up? Because you've worked hard, obviously right. you've been through a lot, right. and it's extremely unfortunate a lot of times when the next generation squanders right. it or they're not prepared for it, right. and then it's like you work your whole entire life, and then right. five years later it's all right. gone. Um, I have real conversations with my kids about. I told my daughter the other day was, I was like, "Yo, turn the lights off." Like, what are you doing? Like, it's, you know how much this light bill is? Like, you know, she's you like, like "How much it costs, Daddy? A thousand? I said, two thousand? I said, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And I'm like, "Yo, but you, 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 you gotta, you know." You still have to live life like you have a filter, right? You, you can't just go out here and spend whatever and do whatever. And the conversation I have with my kids about, first of all, being grateful for what you have and then understanding what you have is a blessing, right? And not squandering it away. Um, my daughter took me out to birthday lunch the other day. She had $50 from the two ferry. She's like, oh my God, I think we're off budget. You ordered too much. <laughs> I'm like, no, we're cool, we're cool. I think it's gonna come in about 35. You gotta leave a five, $10 tip, you'll be good, right? But she understood that, right? And then what I did teach her is, and I teach her all the time, is that, you know, even for myself, I, like St. Francis, if, if I'm getting a service, I will over tip, right? Because I feel like somebody's providing you a service, you should look out for them. But then I ain't gonna go overspend, if that makes sense, mm -hmm. right? But what I, to answer your question, I think that that's more so than leaving them something behind. It's getting them to understand why you're leaving it and what they should do with it, right? Because the thing you don't want to do is enable your kids, right? Because you know a lot of these trust fund kids, you know, they get this money and they lose it mm -hmm. because they was never set up for it, right? And I think. Every day you should like put little seeds in your kids about what money really means. Because there's two reasons. The first reason is they have to understand that money's just a tool. Like it doesn't make you or break you, it doesn't say who you are. If you got less than someone, that doesn't mean I tell my daughter all day, like, you know, we rich. And she's like, Yeah, I know. I like, no, in heart. <laughs> you know what I'm in soul, in spirit. He's like, all right, I guess, you know what I mean? But that's that's the truth for me, right? Because I feel like even if I didn't have, I'm rich in the inside. And the other reason is that if you have too much money, right, and not enough knowledge of what it does, it brings the wrong type of energy and the wrong type of people around you, right? Whether it's bad lawyers, bad accountants, bad people, bad spouses, bad whatever, like it, it, could, it, could, it could bring the wrong type of energy around you. And if you don't understand that, right, you, you're going to put yourself in a situation where you're going to either squander it all away of people gonna figure out how to finesse you out of it, right? Which is still all bad, right? Because if they're doing that, that means daddy's not around anymore, so that's not good. And, and last but not least, you know, I just feel like they have to understand that this is for us. And when I mean us, is their kids, their kids' kids, the kids after that, the kids after that. Like, everybody should be straight because of my, um, my, uh, 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 my, my, like they said, every family has one, right? I chose to be that one. Matriarch right? of the family. Mm -hmm. one, one. And it's like, the estate that I want to build is for all of us, right? So I'm thinking about all of us every time I got to go out here and get it. I'm thinking about all of us every time I got to jump on the plane, every time I got to take a meeting or whatever, because I see the vision, right? But the reality of it is, you know, my parents weren't in the position to leave us anything. And I'm not mad about that, because I don't regret anything I've been through. I think it was all a learning experience. It all, it all built me good, bad, and the ugly, it gave me character. Like they say, I never seen a skilled seller in a calm sea, right? And I think more importantly than making the money and leaving the money, we gotta 
explain to our kids what it means to have it, right? And what it means to set somebody else up. It's like that. You remember that thing where you um, can go get a book and they might have it in, 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 the, in the middle of the neighborhood and you go get one book and take one away and get one <laughs> book and take one away, but you yeah, got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Bring it but back it's like time. the knowledge is there. Yeah. You can't take and not deposit, right? And, and, and that's the thing because I'm so glad that I had to come up from humble beginnings because if I would have been a trust fund kid, like, I don't know what my life would have been, bro. Like, I'm probably scared of that guy. You know what I'm saying? But the fact that I had to go through so much, I have such a respect for money and an understanding for it, but I also know that even without it, I could be the same person, right? Because I can still live the life that I want to live. Now, mind you, I respect it because I know that it's going to enable my kids to go to school where they need to go to school, to set themselves up, to do what they need to do. Because even from a small standpoint, when you look at your kids, it's like even the schools you put them in and, and, and the networking that they're doing at a young age, they're going to know these people. When they, I mean, just think about all the people you went to college with that, that are resources for you now. When you need things, you reach out, hey, bro, what's going on? Woo -woo. And, and you can build that way. And I think that when we was growing up in those inner city schools, we didn't have. <laughs> you know, somebody might make the NBA, the other one might be a kingpin. That's pretty much it. You know what I'm saying? But that's the most important lesson that I want to leave. Like, just understand that money is a tool um, and that life is a marathon. It's not a sprint. You don't have to get it all today, right? And when you do get it, just keep in mind that it's a blessing, right? And it can come and it can go. You just stay the same, right? Because if you stay the same, there's a 99.9% .9 chance that it's going to come back around, right? But if you damage your integrity, your reputation, and all these things in the process to get it, acting out of scarcity, out of, out of, out of being scared yeah. and not love, you already know what it is. Yeah. I got a so, final thought, and I can't get you out of here without having it. Mm. Sold music, sold DVDs, right? You sold spirits. Yep. But now you got adversity for sale. Yes, sir. Talk about how therapeutic that process was and, Ooh. you know, how it feels to be an accomplished author. Man. man. Well, let me, New York Times best-selling author. Yeah, let me go back with the, the forward. Uh, New York Times best-selling author. I think, to me, that I definitely didn't write with that intention. And when I heard it was even a possibility, I was very surprised. Not on this level of it couldn't have happened, but it's almost like this is a ghetto story. This is about the street. How does that work? And... Somebody gave me Think and Grow Rich during the pandemic, and that changed my life. Like, it just made me look at books totally different, it, which really added on to my, my thirst and my hunger to, for more knowledge, right? Because I'm like, this is crazy. This is just like Pablo Escobar, uh, El Chapo <laughs> leaving you his, his, his book, How You Got It Done. It's like, this is amazing, right? It is in one book. And I'm like, I got to really figure out how to get this back in the culture, reading, for one and then putting a lot of knowledge in one space because there's no one book that you can pick up to help you get through the streets. And I was trying to put that together. Um, therapeutic, very, because I've been on a self-healing journey for about 10 years now, maybe eight and a half, nine. And I thought I had dealt with a lot of things, but what I realized is I had packed a lot of things away to kind of forget about them because I felt like they no longer served me. And in writing and having to read the audio version of the book, a lot of those wounds were opened back up, right? And I still had more work to do, but it was like, you know, it was real. Because as a grown man, like if you're going through this when you're self-soothing and you're doing all these things and you're living that life, you know, you're in real time, you know, you're numbing your pain. I can't numb it now. So now I got to deal with, it firsthand, you know, and, and, and reading, writing and reading the book uh, really showed me, like, it was a lot of good times, but it was a lot of bad. And it just reminded me of all the things that I thought I surpassed that I had to go back and still work on to this day because um, trauma is trauma, bro. And, and, and what I mean by adversity for sale is, like, even when people thought that I was at my highest, I was at my lowest. And even, like, people look at you now, like, well, you're selling millions of records, but I feel good. Look at two, like, you know what I'm saying? So, like, now I'm in a place where I'm at peace. I don't care what sale, you know what I'm saying? We good, either way. So then, I, again, I was acting out of, uh, out, of, out, of, uh, out of being scared, you know what I'm saying? Out of fear. Now I'm living out of love. So for me, you know, adversity for sale was how can I give back 
to the culture in a way and tell my story so that they can see, even if they're going through something, it's, 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 this is not the end all be all. Like you still got, you know, a chance. Like my man John Lennon say, if, 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 in the end it'll be okay. If it's not okay, it's, it's, it's not the end. And I really truly believe that because it's like, I would have thought my end would have been a long time ago, right? And the reason why I ended adversity for sale on versus because I think that's the first time people actually started to see what my thought process was from then. I had been learning the whole time, you know what I'm saying? But now it's like when we get here, it's just like this is this is where I'm cutting this off because the person that you saw and that you felt like was in the box was already thinking 10, 20 years ahead, right? And this was one of the things that had to happen for you to understand this is where I'm really at and this is really my stance. So even like to somebody who might think there wasn't a, a popular decision, again, it's not about the money, it's not about me, it's about this generation that's coming behind us that's gotta understand like it's more to life than just dying, right? You still gotta live, right? And, and most of these leaders that have came in, like my brother Nipsey, one of the smartest per people I knew, right? But when you get caught up in these situations, you know, the streets and even everything you learn is still a tight line because you're still playing from both sides. I chose to step all the way fully over to this side so that I can be over here first. You know when Jay did the NFL thing and everybody's like, you tripping, and now you got Usher, you know what I'm saying? Now you got Rayana. <laughs> but it's like I had to step over here so that I can get this game and this information back. And that's what the book was about. It's about, okay, I'm starting another book of my life from, from this moment on when I walk off this stage. And I'm gonna give y'all all the information that I have. But until then, this is how I got this far. And this is the decision I made. Jay Jeezy Jenkins. Yes, sir. It's been a pleasure, my brother. Thank pleasure you. for y'all. Appreciate y'all yeah. having me, man. Continued success, brothers, and I'll be expecting the invite next year. For absolutely, sure, absolutely. Sure. For sure. My brother. My guy, my brother. I appreciate my you, bro. Already. Ally is a leading digital financial service company and the nation's largest all digital bank. Ally is proud to support creators in music and the 50th anniversary of hip hop because they understand the economic freedom that hip hop has provided black musicians, entertainers, and entrepreneurs. With that being said, we had the opportunity to reach out to a local business while we were in Atlanta shooting with Jeezy. We would like to officially and financially honor the hustle of creative soul photography. The visionary husband and wife team of Karan and Regis Bethencourt at Creative Soul are pioneers in the art of visual storytelling. For years, their lenses have painted a vivid picture of black youth worldwide, capturing beauty, resilience, and culture. Let's actually hear from the owners themselves, Karan and Regis. Pleasure to meet you. How's it going? Good. Thank you for having us. <laughs> Pleasure to have you. Let's jump right into it. How have you used your influence as entrepreneurs to become an ally for your community? Oh, that's a great question. I think that, you know, for us, everything starts with our youth. You know, we um, use our platform as an opportunity really to give them a voice. Uh, we feel like there were not enough um, positive images and positive representation of Black youth in the media. And so we really use our platform as a way to um, you know, let them have a voice, whether, you know, they are interested in science or math or um, ballet or, you know, um, being a DJ or to becoming an astronaut. Um, you know, we really want to just highlight a diverse range of Black voices on our platform. Our kids are our foundation, so if you work that foundation, we'll have a better future. Yes. <laughs> what do you see your business evolving into? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so we really see ourselves as more than just photographers. Uh, we really want to become, um, you know, more of an empowerment company for uh, Black youth. Um, and, you know, that starts with our photography as the foundation, but it evolves into products such as the, the princess dolls or merchandise or back to school items, maybe fashion items, you know, um, TV and film, uh, you know, um, animation or cartoons or something like that. So we definitely kind of see ourselves as an empowerment brand um, for kids around the world. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Financially honor the hustle presented by Ally.